Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Love one another. Love each other, as our gospel reading said. Amen. See you later. (laughs) That sounds really easy, and it doesn't take long to say, but man, is it tough. Man, is it tough. And this is the main part of Jesus' final instructions to his disciples in John chapter 15, which is our gospel reading today. It's right before he knows that he's going to be betrayed and handed over, suffer at the hands of sinful men, and ultimately be executed, crucified on a cross. And so he has one more quiet moment with his disciples before all that begins, and his instructions center around love one another. And not just that, but love one another as I have loved you. And that last part, I think, is an important distinction because love is a word in our culture that is being used to so many different ends. But really, this is the new thing that Christ brought into the world. This is the reason he came down to earth, born under the law, fully man and fully God, was to reestablish, recreate love as God intended it from the very beginning. And he did just that. The irony being that this last instruction from him is right before he puts on the greatest display in all the universe of the very love he's speaking of in the presence of his disciples and as we bear witness to still today in the innocent suffering and death of the Son of God for the sake of unloving, unlovable, and unworthy sinners such as yourselves, such as me, such as his disciples whom he's speaking to. But this is a stewardship sermon series. So what does this have to do with stewardship? Well, there's a reason this is the final instruction that Jesus gives his disciples. Love is the driving force behind everything we do as Christians, behind all the instructions that God gives us in Jesus and in his word. And that certainly includes how he wishes us to manage the things that he blesses us with. Now, it's important, I like to point out, I think it's really important that we finish the love one another with the as I have loved you. Because if Jesus is bringing something new into the world in the form of love, that means it's not something we naturally know or do. So this is more than being nice. It's more than accepting differences of opinion and lifestyle just to not fight. Right? Our culture defines love as sort of a non-confrontational exterior acceptance. But if that was really love, it seems like our country... And our society is more divided than ever. And really, this isn't unique to the United States, but it's happening everywhere in the civilized world. It doesn't seem like we've been honest about what love is, or nor as love intends to be. It turns out that when God creates something to function in a certain way, that when it doesn't, things don't go so well. So Jesus is calling his disciples, and he's calling us to love one another as he has first loved us. So he's calling us to his love, not the love of the world, not the love that naturally occurs in our sinful human hearts, but the ones that he calls us to, that he raises us up into when he gives us his Holy Spirit. Now this means the love we express with his gifts that we have been entrusted with is guided by a generous, self-sacrificing love. After all, that is the way that God loves you in Jesus. That is the very thing he puts on display for his disciples right after this teaching in John 15. A generous, self-sacrificing love. He gives up everything for you, for his disciples, for the sinful of this world by bringing back the original love God intended to make. So Jesus' teachings on stewardship contain this theme of love, but it's a little bit more complicated than it sounds. 
because the Bible gives us specific iterations of how to love in this way with the blessings that God has given us. The main themes in Jesus' teachings on stewardship are investment, vocation, and faith. Now we're going to hop around the scriptures a little bit to highlight where you find some of those things. So you may be familiar with the parable of the talents. And that highlights the investment portion of Jesus' theme of stewardship. And what is investment based on? It's based on returns. You invest in things that you think are going to give you a gain in your return. And so it is in the parable of the talents that when the servants that's given five talents and two talents invest those talents in something worthwhile, they get a return. And then one servant doesn't invest. He buries the money because he's afraid of the consequences of losing it. And he is chastised by the master when he returns. But that parable is not really talking about the stock market and investing in a company you think is going to go big so you can make a lot of money. Certainly, if that happens to you, that's that's a blessed thing. And God intended it to happen. But what he's really talking about is an eternal mindset when it comes to investment. We're called to love as Christ loved us, and what Christ did in his love is he shifted our focus from this world to his eternal kingdom to come. And he brought us into it. And now he calls us as his disciples back then and even today to have the same sort of investment mindset, to invest our time and our gifts and abilities, our money and his provision in our life, in order to bring that love to bear in the lives of people so that they too can, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, be brought to a refocusing on the kingdom of God, not on the things of this world that pass away. The second is vocation. Vocation has kind of made a big comeback in teaching in many churches, but it really originated most completely with Martin Luther. And this is a calling based on positions of responsibility in relationship to other people. That's really what a vocation is. So I have a pastoral vocation, which means I have certain responsibilities to the people entrusted into my care in that capacity. Fathers have a calling, sons, daughters, mothers, co-workers, and friends. Many of you, all of you, have many vocational callings. And the purpose of this vocational calling is to live in such a way with your time and your talents and your treasures that reflects the love of God in Christ Jesus. So that means that in order to live a holy and God-pleasing life, contrary to what they taught in the Middle Ages, you don't have to swear off the world and all its pleasures and live in a building up in a mountain and pray to God every day, all day. Rather, God has sent you to the unique places you are, into the unique callings that He has placed you in, so that you can reflect Christ to the people he's placed in your life in those places, whether it is your workplace, whether it is here in the body of Christ at Ascension, or whether it is among your biological family. So managing money and good good responsibility when it comes to the gifts that God has given you is so that you can care for those in your charge. And that you have money not only to care for them, but to give generously to those in need. And this applies the same for the gift of your time and your abilities. The last teaching is faith. There is an important component to stewardship that relies on faith. Because sometimes when you're asked to give something in service to another within your calling or in service to the church within your calling, it may be very tempting to think I could sure use this somewhere else. How tempting is it to look at that tithe that comes out of your bank account every month and think, I could really use that to put in my savings, or I could really use that to help pay the bills this month and just get a little bit ahead. But that's where faith comes in. I mentioned probably the most famous Bible account in Jesus' teaching on this aspect of stewardship to the kids. in when the widow gives her last two coins into the offering plate. Fully trusting in God, all these other people were giving way more money than she was, yet Jesus points out her giving because it was done in faith. 
and it was generous. And we are called to the same. And really, if, if we put this in terms of, of our Lutheran theology, and when you get down to brass tacks, the question is, when the chips are down, who do you trust with your well-being? The almighty dollar? The amount of land you own? The number of relatives and social connections you have? Or is it almighty God and his promise of provision? In order for us to give generously in faith, our trust must remain in God. So in order to be loving and generous with God's gifts, as Jesus is teaching so poignantly to his disciples and us in John 15, and yes, he means all things, we must be connected to the source of that love. Because I hate to break it to you, but the source of that love isn't you, and it's not me. It can't be found in this world, which is why God and his grace and mercy came from outside of it into it in the form of Jesus to bring that love to bear in our lives. And so as we still struggle with our sinful flesh, and as we still live in a fallen world until our Lord returns a second time to make everything new, it is important that in order to maintain this spirit of self-sacrificing generous love, to remain connected to its source. So we come to worship as you have this morning, or for those who are watching online, to hear God's word, to be reminded that no matter how terribly your week has gone, you are still receiving this love from Christ. And in so doing, in the reception of his Holy Spirit, you are now able to, albeit imperfectly, reflect that love in your life to those he's placed you with. The sacramental gifts of Jesus in baptism, a visible promise there for your benefit that when things get rough, you can remind yourself that even though you're not feeling very godly or you know you haven't been following the commandments of your Lord very well, you have a visible promise that you can refer to where he has made you his own. The very same word that said, let there be light said, you are mine. And then today as we gather around the Lord's table, for our faith to be nourished and fed, a visible promise of the forgiveness of our sins to sustain us as we wage the spiritual battle against the forces of darkness in this world, a reminder that we are not alone, not only in facing the temptations of our own flesh, but the temptations that this world has to drag us away from this very love that Jesus calls us to. And lastly, he blesses us with the body of Christ. Take a look around the people that are sitting in the pews in front of you, behind you, and next to you. God has placed you here, not accidentally, among one another, for it is not good to be alone. We are created to be in community, and one of the main functions of that community is to continually point one another to Jesus. So when you notice that somebody's going through a rough time, or maybe they've had bad news, or maybe they've lost a loved one recently. We don't ignore them. We don't let them deal with that on their own. We reach out and we share those burdens. Because we can love in that way now that we have received that love from Jesus. So, you may have noticed we put a little trifold in your bulletin today. This is a pledge form. And I know uh, pledge forms, maybe these bring up sour memories for you, but I, I want to highlight the main purpose of a document like this. The main purpose of this document is not for us to be able to know how much you're going to give us, but it's for you. God is calling us to have a certain spirit about the generosity and the way that we use the gifts that he's entrusted us. And so this pledge isn't just focused on money, although that's a part of it. It's also focused on our worship our service in the church, as well as our uh, ability to follow the command to be in the Word of God and to learn about our faith and to learn about Him so that we can better reflect His love for others. And to that end, the only person who's going to know your financial pledge is you and the financial secretary. Because that is a number for you so that you can help meet your own goal to try and strive to live in this spiritually healthy way that God intends. And the rest of it will be given to the office so that we can, when we're looking for people to help out, we have a little bit of information to go on 
for people who've made their pledges for ways they wish to serve in the church. Now, this, this, the goal of this is primarily for you, for your spiritual well-being, a reminder, a written commitment. It's sort of like they say that when you endeavor to do, establish a new habit or make a big change in your life, the percentage of success goes way up when you write it down, when you make it a visible goal. And that's the purpose of this. It's for your own spiritual well-being. Now, we'll be turning these in during the offering next week. However, if you're worried you'll forget, you can put them uh, in the offering today uh, if you want to fill those out. Um, although, sorry to say, my sermon is nearly done, so you won't have time to do that during the rest of the sermon. But, um, and if you have any questions about this or if you forget one, we'll have extras next week. So the challenge that we're presented with in the scriptures when it comes to stewardship is this. Love one another as Christ has loved you. The root and heart of this instruction helps us see that God intends to give us blessing for our own well-being and provision, but also so that we can reflect the love of Christ to those in our lives that we meet every day. So to that end, we earnestly pray and pledge and strive against the machinations of this world and our own sinful flesh so that we can remain connected to the love of Christ in the love of God in Christ Jesus. So let me remind you fully what that love is as we close. That love is that you are loved by God, that he has chosen you as his own, not by anything that you have done, not by being worthy in and of your deeds or the way you conduct yourself, but rather while you were still sinner, while you were still a sinner, Christ died on the cross for you. And now because of that, he has given you his perfect righteousness. He has given you His Spirit, a Holy Spirit, which now enables us to strive against the forces of darkness in this world and ultimately the promise of everlasting life with Him in heaven. So go forth in the peace of that knowledge, the joy of that knowledge, and love one another as Christ has loved you. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in his promise of love for you until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.